Wow, where do I start? <laughs> Growing up in Southampton, the black woman's perspective, huh? You know, the first thing I'll, I'll talk about is actually um, the Great Migration. And the Great Migration started in 1916 and 1972. And the reason why I'm gonna mention that is because there you are. My mom um, and all my family, those are my aunts, um, and my grand and my uncle. And on the far picture, you'll see them all beautiful aunties all in a row. And um, just briefly, the, um, the great migration, generally what happened was uh, the oldest sibling would come out first and they would set up, you know, apartment and find a job or whatever. And then the other siblings would follow. So my auntie who's on the far, far left, um, Aunt Finney, we called her, it was Florence Ali, um, she came out and went to Harlem. And so everybody came and followed her into Harlem. It was 112, 116th Street in Harlem, USA. So after that, my Aunt Evelyn came out and then my mom is in the middle there. It's a little out of order, but my mom is in the middle with the big smile that looks like me. And then there's my Aunt Cora, then my Aunt, um, my Aunt Ruthie and then my Aunt Geraldine and my Aunt Baby is not in that picture, but she's in the lower picture there at a wedding. And so also in that picture, you'll see my uncle um, as well. So it was eight of them as well. And then on far up the corner there, I don't know if you can see my mom's picture in the corner upper, upper right. And then um, that's a picture of my Aunt uh, Estelle, I mean, my Aunt Cora and my mom, a picture in the city. Uh, Brenda, wait, when did, who came to Southampton? Okay, my Aunt Evelyn, that's the second in from on the seated there on the couch, <clears throat> she came first. She actually got her beautician license in New York. And that's kind of how it's tied into the museum because she got a beautician license and she came out and she was one of the, she was the beautician that was in the barbershop originally back in the 40s, 50s, I guess it was at that point. Well, the, mu the museum you're referencing is, is not the Southampton History Museum, it's the new the Southampton New African American Museum. Yes, it is, 240 North Sea right. Road. So, so your, aunt, your aunt was there, I didn't know that in, in the uh, barbershop. Absolutely, absolutely. And I used to go there when I was like, I think maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I used to go there and answer the phones for her and write down appointments for her. And I don't know if people who maybe are listening who remember where the um, Dunkin' Donuts is. It used to be, we called a Greasy Spoon Diner. So I used to do coffee runs for her down there. And I used to love it because all the extra change, I got to buy a little candy for myself. So that's my connection really to the museum. That's kind of how, you know, intimate connection with me to the Southampton African American Museum. Sheila, Sheila, what was the name of that Greasy Spoon? Are you there, Sheila? <laughs> Oh dear. Well, um, well, Sheila, I don't remember what the name of it was and all I just know was the Greasy Spoon Diner. I don't know if he, it probably, I'm sure it had a name, but it's right there now where the, actually where the Dunkin' Donuts is right there on the highway across from the gas station and McDonald's and Burger King. Well, um, I can't get Sheila on. So, and the wedding down, uh, on the bottom here uh, in color, that's in Southampton? No, 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 that's actually in the Bronx. That's actually in the Bronx at a um, um, hotel or a resort in um, the Bronx where my auntie was married. Yeah. So your aunt is, is the one with the uh, the hat. She's getting married. Yeah, she got married. And yeah, she's the one with the, you know, the, all the wedding uh, attire on. And those are all of my aunties and my uncle. And I was so, we were so happy because my uncle actually lives in Virginia. That's where we actually um, came from. And also with the great migration, <clears throat> just to uh, it, you know, extend on that just a bit, is most of the people that are here now in Southampton either migrated from North Carolina or Virginia. So my mom was from uh, Roanoke or Waverly, Virginia, and my dad was from Caratuck, North Carolina. Oh, okay, so then, then um, that brings us up to the 1960s. And, you know, just to also, um, before she shows that picture, the reason why, you know, I, people know the history, the reason why, uh, you know, almost 16 million people left the South to come to the North because of slavery and, the, you know, the lynching and the Jim Crow. So, um, yeah, so it was, you know, it was a terrible time during that time. So they want to escape and come this way. 
for a better life. So the next uh, photograph was very graphic. Yes. And yes. horrible. Yes. Tell us the story, Brenda. What's the story? You know, the, the story, the brief story I'll share, if you look at the bottom picture there, you know, that's the story that, you know, came to me when I was looking at how, you know, um, how it was when, you know, when the, when the slave master was doing the lynching, as you can see, they're all dressed up like it was a celebration, you know, and the other sad part about it is usually the person that was killed, they also brought out their own families, whether it was their wives, their children, you know, the brothers or sisters or whatever, because that was like, you know, to put fear in them, you know, to, you know, not to run away or whatever, to be, you know, good slaves. Um, but the thing that really kind of, you know, I thought about this at one point was um, not only did it put a fear into the people of color, but also to look at that bottom picture where it says family affair. They all, the slaves masters also brought out their own family. And it was almost to me in my interpretations, like this is how you treat black people. So that was kind of a, kind of a disturbing thing to think about, but you know, this is, this is what happened. And this is why a lot of people left the South to come to a better life. I worked in a uh, historical society in Pennsylvania many years ago, and, and they had postcards of lynchings mm. that were just as graphic that you could send to your friends. And it, oh my God. It, it's, it's so, so awful. Uh, ne next one, Joanna. Uh, Brenda, when, when are you gonna tell the story about uh, Job's Lane? Um, I'm gonna tell the story about Job's Lane. Um, I can tell it right now. Okay. This is actually, um, I'm not gonna cry, but this is a picture of my mom and my dad who's no longer with us. And this is the house that I grew up in at 81 Halsey Avenue. And, you know, like I said, my mom and my dad, they came from the South and they kind of brought that, you know, that fear or that, that protection, you know, to us. So they didn't allow us to go down Job's Lane. For some reason, they wouldn't allow us to go down Job's Lane. But when I was in high school, I think it was a junior or senior in high school, I was, you know, we were doing what all, you know, high school and, you know, kids do. We had probably a little uh, tasty taste. And we decided we were going to drive down Job's Lane to see what it was like. So we went down Windmill Lane, those who are familiar with Southampton, we went down Windmill Lane and we made that left down Job's Lane. And I'm like, you know, we're looking in the window, we see these white, you know, um, you know, I don't want to call them dummies, but you know, white- Mannequins. Mannequins in dressed in all these wonderful outfits and all these expensive clothes. And I was like, so what's the big deal? But we get to the end of Job's Lane to make a left to go down Main Street. And this white guy was coming around the corner and he hollered out to us, what are you N-words doing here? And it was kind of shocking to be honest. And I'm not gonna tell the full story, but we kind of um, stopped the car and tried to let him know that was a nice thing for him to say to us. And, but that was my reality check was why my parents was trying to protect us because they were protected from the reality or protected from maybe not really, I really didn't know that, that we were experiencing that, you know, but that happened right here in good old village of Southampton. Yeah. And that was in the, in the, you know, 70, I was, I graduated in 1973. So I think that was probably between 71 and 73 that when that happened. We're, we're going to go back to a happier place, but um, I just want to put in there that 15 years ago when I came to Southampton, I, I was shocked at the prejudice. Mm. And it wasn't so much about, it wasn't actually about Black people. It was about Shinnecock, Latinos, and Jews. Really? I, I just, uh, you know, I, I just heard a lot of undercover stuff. People thought it was okay to say things like to me because I look waspy and, and, uh, <laughs> and I work at, you know, a history museum. Right. Uh, it doesn't seem so bad as it used to be, but uh, Sheila, what what do you think? What? You can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me, Sheila? Oh yeah, I can hear you. Good. What what? Any experiences with uh, I don't know prejudice? And You're right. When I was growing up, the only prejudice I remember was against the Shinnecocks. Wow. So that I I never heard any prejudice against Black or Jewish people. I, I told you the first time I experienced that, that that it was prejudice against Jews is when I went to a Catholic school 
in New York City for my nursing degree. And a nun referred to the nearby university as NYU. Oh, wow. And I, I didn't understand what that meant. So I asked my classmates, who were all 99% a product of 12 years of Catholic schools. And they said, well, that's the Jews. We got to yeah. stay away from the Jews. Wow. And my neighbor in Southampton was the, were the Lipitzes. They were Jewish. Nobody ever did that for them. So that in Southampton, though, I will say the only thing I experienced, I heard was against the Shinnecocks. They were considered inferior. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, there, there, I had a conversation with a woman uh, and she just was making cracks about Jews and I couldn't take it anymore. I said, well, you know, my grandmother was a Jew mm. and her, her, <laughs> And, and whether she is or not is beside the point. Right. But then she exactly. turned to me and said, oh, she is not. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. But, but uh, an African-American experience here is, is, uh, is long. And um, I don't know, most people don't know that slavery was in Southampton until uh, the 1830s. But you know, my dad, um, I want to say my dad had a landscaping business. If you can look at our lawn there and the beautiful flowers, he yeah. kept our place immaculate. You know, it was so beautiful. But he, most of his customers were from Meadow Lane. You know, most of his customers were, you know, the rich people on Meadow Lane and those areas. And he did very well for years. He had his, you know, Simmons landscaping business. And I used to help him, you know, with the books and stuff. But, you know, he, he never, he never had a problem. Matter of fact, if I was look, looking to find my dad, you would find him generally at Sippin' Sodas. It was a group of black guys used to always sit at the bar at the stool at Sippin' Sodas. And that was anytime I want to, you know, I needed 35 cents to get my lunch, you know, at school, 35 cents. Um, that's what I'd find him. I'd find him and Mr. Stewart and a few other black men sitting there at the counter at Sippin' Sodas. So, you know, even though I think there was, you know, that, you know, racism there, it was, it was still always there, you know, but I don't think it was not as, not as avert, I guess, you know, as, as it was. I, I love this photograph because your parents are separated, but they're looking at each other. Yeah, it was a love thing. It was definitely a love thing. Okay, next. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a precious picture, you know, that we took and um, they're both gone, you know, I miss them both. Um, but yeah, that was a special picture that I keep a lot of. And you know, unfortunately, the house is no longer with us either. <laughs> okay, next one, Joanna. That's what I was saying. The house got uh, taken down, I guess, two years ago. And next door to it was, um, you know, where I grew up on Halsey Avenue was a barber shop. Actually, the Randy, uh, that's a cute little picture of, um, of the car that was there in our yard. That was my dad's car. And I think that's, I don't think that's me next to, next to the car, but I know it's my sister Linda that's in the, uh, uh, the little chair there, the horse chair there. But um, we grew up, Rex, and that, you can see it right there. That's the barbershop right next door there. And next door to that was, there we go. Next door to that was um, Miss E, we call it Miss Evers, it was a candy store. So, you know, this is where I grew up and inside the barbershop was so cool. It was a, ju a jukebox and a pool table. So we used to go and hang out there at the juke joint, I mean, not the juke joint, the barbershop to play music. And, you know, I don't know how many as old as I am or as around that time, but used to put the quarter in and a really a, a live 45 would come down and play the record and we used to shoot pool in there. So it was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool. But the, those places are gone. Both of those, my house that I grew up in and this building here is no longer. Within the last, you know, couple of years. It's, it's... Absolutely. Absolutely. So that whole street is so weird. Yeah. My sister uh, visited me from Georgia and we, she was determined to go down that street and we drove down that street and it was just, you would never know, just never know that, you know, this is where, you know, what was there. They're all million dollar houses now. And actually the house that's, you know, that was placed my, my our house is still for sale, which is really odd because it's been built there for a while now. And, but all the other houses are for sale and people are living there, but our house still has a for sale sign on, which is very interesting. When I f moved to uh, Southampton in 2006, I lived right behind that store. Really? On David White's Lane. And, you know, I, I was new in town and people said, oh, where are you living? Oh, David White's Lane. Oh, you're living in the ghetto. <laughs> Not well, that, a, that was a black community. 
That was a black community. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting that you they, you were told that because unfortunately that name somehow interfered with some of the value of our homes, to be honest with you. Of course. Right. You know, so that was, you know, kind of significant to say that, to label us that way, you know? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow, 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 wow. This is where, um, <laughs> this is cool. This, my dad is the one in the white shirt. And um, which, which on the left uh, with his elbow on the bar? No, 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 no. He's the one right in the middle with his glass up. With the polo shirt? Yes. Okay. That's my dad. And that oh. was at the Cottage Inn in East Hampton. And uh, wow. If you don't mind, if, I'll try to make it quick, but I want to read this book. Uh, it's just a, a point, um, a, 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 just a page out of this book. And this is. The next picture on the side is actually the Love and Spoonfuls. And that is actually inside the Cottage Inn. And I just want to briefly, if I could, I'm trying to make it brief. It says, and this is out of the book on page 20 of Hotter Than a Matchstick by Stephen Boone. And it says, a servant's community had sprung up to serve these part-time Ham Hamptonites in the area's hotel, restaurant, and storefronts. And it was their... These folks were, sh were who helped from the South Fork black middle class. Many were people who had made enough money working in service jobs in New York City to buy homes in the then affordable communities in East Hampton Springs, Bridgehampton and Sag Harbor. While there was no open policy of segregating neighborhoods as a practice practical matter, many of these smaller subset communities had their own little village centers apart from the white villages. The Cottage Inn was in one of those small villages located in Springs Road, about two miles east of downtown East Hampton and owned by New York City transplant named Noah Simmons. And it was the cottage had served a restaurant, bar, liquor and convenience store as well as a gathering spot for locals. And I want to move on to just read this other part because I thought it's pretty cool. It says, at that time, they were called the Kingsmen they really weren't called the Loving Spoonfuls at first. They were called the Kingsmen. Wait, but wait, wait. Kingsman. I, I saw the Kingsmen in Lawrence, Kansas in 1962. Are you kidding me? I didn't know that they evolved into the Loving Spoonfuls. That's amazing. Wow. And it says here, um, he said, I have to admit it was, this is Stephen Boone's uh, uh, sharing this. I have to admit it was awkward at first playing to a mostly black audience that was older than the one we played for at the Palm Terrace. But the audience did grow to like us and we in turn helped cultivate a new demographic for the Cottage Inn. The rich Hamptonites and their kids began trickling into the club on the weekends during the early summer of 1962. And by summer's end, the Cottage Inn was the place to be and was seen to be the swinging set of New Yorkers partying out in the Hamptons. Wow. Wish I was there. So, you know, really quick to, you know, in Biden of time, I had the pleasure when I found this out, I was kind of like, what? Because we, when I was like that point, I was what, seven years old. We used to go down there when it was the restaurant, but we went there during the day. So I really had no idea of all of this until um, in 2019, I came across this. I got the book, my sister, <laughs> My sister Sandra literally um, found Stephen Boone's number. This is how bold our family is, okay? And I found him, contacted him, talked to him, and we've been friends. And he actually come out in uh, 2019, and he they did a concert at the river in Riverhead on Main Street. And I had the pleasure of being uh, the guest of his, his guest. And after the show, he invited me to his brother's house in West Hampton. So those are the pictures that I sat with him and just talked to him. He told me about his whole life. It was amazing, amazing, amazing. So, so and, this, is, this is him in your house on the bottom? No, no, no. This is him at his brother's house in West Hampton. He invited me to his brother's house the day after they had the wonderful content. And he was so amazing because he got on stage and he, he talked about my dad. He talked about how, you know, it wasn't for, you know, my dad was the one who helped them start, you know, back in East Hampton in 62. And then he said he had a special guest there, here, which was um, 
um, Noah Simmons' daughter. So it was pretty, pretty cool. I mean, obviously the concert was awesome, you know? But wow. I never knew this. I just found this out about a year or two ago. Wow. Okay, ne next one, Joanna. That, <laughs> that was growing up in Southampton. In Southampton, um, that's me up there. One, two, three, four, five in on the top. Oh boy, that's a wonderful picture. Hmm. Anyway, um, huh. that was called the sweet... Uh, the sweet honesty. We had a local softball team that we we uh, put together, and um, we we was in competition in Richhampton, I think, and East Hampton. They got the same teams together. They got teams together as well. So we played against uh, different teams, and it was really a lot of fun. And I I have a scar to uh, to this day. I was the pitcher, and uh, one of the guys who was you know helping us practice, he hit a line drive as we were practicing, and I, my glove went up but it just slipped over and I had um, a big gash over my eye and the blood was just trickling, trickling down. And finally they said, you know, you really got to go get this stitched up. So I literally had to go to the hospital and get it stitched up. But we had so much fun, you know, and that literally was on Halsey Avenue. It was a field. Right now across from the church, you see a whole big development, but that was a whole open field is that's where we had our games and we practiced. This, this looks like a family uh, team here, all the, all the Simmons. Um, my sister, yes, my sister up there um, in the second. And then I don't know if my other, yeah, my other, yeah, yes. Two, it's two or three of us are, are in that picture. Absolutely, absolutely. That's great. Those are good old days, good old days. That's a picture of moving forward. That's a picture of my class of 1973 was at one of our class reunions. I think we were at Cooper's Beach or either Dune Beach, one of the two. Um, I had a great class. Class of 73 was pretty cool. And during that time, you know, it was 73, it was, you know, uh, the coming together with blacks and whites were getting, rid of, you know, they were coming together little by little at that time. But we actually had a sit out during that time because we wanted a black studies teacher and a black studies class. So we actually sat out to, uh, and to like to demonstrate and we got what we needed. We, and, but it was a lot of our classmates, as you see, sat out with us. I tease them sometimes. I say, you guys just want to skip class, but they were being supportive. They were being supportive. How, how many of these people are still around? Um, I think the majority of them that you see there are still around. Some of them obviously are out of the, you know, out of the um, in different states, but a lot of them are still here. I'm, I don't know if you see Pam Jackson is still, Susan. Susan oh, no. Oh, there she is. There. I see her. She's on the front row. Yeah, Stephen Frank. Um, Barbara, Barbara Lisa, I was just on the phone with her. She lives in Rhode Island now. Um, so it's a lot of people still around. A lot of people still around. So, so is this uh, 2003, I'm guessing? or I was hoping you didn't ask me that because I don't <laughs> <laughs> You know, we graduated in 73, so we were very good of having, you know, 10 year, 15 year and 20 year. So that might have been the 20th. Uh, that, that, it's a, impressive that, that amount. Uh, of maybe 25th, but we stayed, we're very close class. So we stayed pretty tight. So how, how about uh, prejudice in the, in the, in the schoolroom? You know, not really, not really. Um, it really wasn't that I could sense, not really. You know, like I said, we did sit out because we wanted to have that Black Studies teacher in the Black Studies class. So on that level, maybe, you know, um, but I'll tell a really quick story that's kind of funny. Um, I did want to, I was I was sitting across a gentleman, um, I don't know if I sh I'll share his name. His name is Mark Rump. And we were in study hall together and we kind of start liking each other. And he asked me for the, to go to the prom. And I went home and asked my mom and dad and they said, no, they absolutely said no. But I did get a chance after we went, we had the prom dance. I get, I got a chance to dance with him at the prom, but that was kind of a tint of the, not really prejudice, but still my dad and my mom feeling like you know, they didn't really want me to be with any, you know, white people because it, it was protection. It wasn't anything. I don't think they were racist. I think it was just a matter of protection and the fear from coming from south to north, you know. Brenda, the, uh, Sheila, maybe you can help me with this. I, I, I've I been here 15 years and I get the feeling the people who were raised here and went to school in Southampton were much more tolerant than maybe, you know, people who spent summers here. I, I think that's true. I, can you, yes. Can you yes. Yeah, we can see you. Okay. No, I, th I think uh, we were all like one, I don't know, it sounds corny, but we were like one big happy group, you know. Um, 
and the, and the summer people who were a lot of Manhattanites, um, they came with the prejudice, not not us. They didn't even like us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, we were the we were the locals. Right, you know? right. We were the yeah, the underclass. The trash. Yeah. The <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, we've got great photographs of high school uh, uh, sports teams, and it's, you know, it's uh, at least one-third black, you know, it's, it's, um, oh, yeah, well, they were the best athletes, the, so the black guys were the, and the girls were, but were, I, I think uh, the black population now is, is, is diminished from what it used to be, I, I just have, very that. much so, very, very much so, yeah, because they can't afford to live here, yeah, yeah. And so that's really my main, you know, drive to continue to make sure that, you know, the Southampton African American Museum, you know, will leave a legacy that, you know, we were here and we contribute a lot to this community. So. Well, we had a hot, hot summer about, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. So maybe that just improves the atmosphere somewhat. I think, I hope more people are more aware. Go ahead, Brenda. Okay. I'm going to do the next photo. Okay, we're gonna move now to my family. Um, those are my sisters. Um, and that's my grandson. <laughs> I had to put that picture there. I had to put that I'm picture glad. there. I'm so glad. I love it, I love it. But this is my sisters. Um, the one on, you're looking at, you know, looking at an older picture on the top and a recent, a more recent picture at the bottom. And on the far left is my sister Janie. She's the oldest. And then it's me, who I'm in the pink. And then it's my sister Sandra on the far, right and then it's my sister Linda um, next to me uh, there and my sister Jenny lives in Florida my sister Linda lives in Virginia and my sister Sandra lives in Georgia and I have another sister Janice she's um handicapped she's unfortunate she has cerebral, she had cerebral palsy and she lives now in Dix Hills but that is my wonderful cute little grandson and his name is AJ and he's uh, he's a very special guy very very special guy Adorable. And you go to the next picture, you'll see uh, more pictures of my family. That's the upper left there is my, uh, my daughter, Tia, uh, Takaya. That's the mom of my grandson. And um, she lives in Maryland. And then the next picture next to that is my daughter, Tiana, and my granddaughter, my beautiful, beautiful granddaughter, Nylasia, who I'm so proud she went to FIT and graduated and done a wonderful, wonderful job. And she actually is an artist in the paintings. Tom, I think you bought a painting from I her. I bought one of her paintings, yep. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And then the bottom picture is a funny picture of all of us. It was a Christmas day. We Tiana brought us the, um, all these onesies. And so that was a picture of us in the uh, Christmas day. And that lower picture on the right is uh, we used to travel to North Carolina like every Thanksgiving. And that was um, the gentleman all the way in the top left is my grand, uh, my nephew, um, Ron Neal. He lives in, um, in North Carolina. And that's my whole family there. And his wife is in the middle in the blue. And my um, nieces and nephews are involved in that picture and also my, my sisters. So we used to have a pretty cool uh, Thanksgiving there. But, you know, of course, things changed and people moved and so we didn't, you know, we haven't done that in a while, but that was pretty, we had a lot of fun. I have a lot of, my, my sisters and my family are hysterical. We do, when we have fun, we have fun. I mean, lots and lots of fun. And I miss that. I miss that. It, it shows, it's so obvious you guys are having a, a great time. Yeah, we're a little crazy bunch for sure. The next picture. Uh, we're going to move on. I guess these are pictures from, um, as I, um, this is dealing basically with the museum. Um, which I've been working on for about 16 years. And um, we, had, we had a wonderful time where we would actually do a collaboration with the school, the local school. And um, so they would come over. Um, the teachers would actually um, have the students do an, some sort of art. And generally this was during Black History Month, um, but I was always um, a little um, extra. I would actually make it sure that it, was, it wasn't just February. It would probably start Martin Luther King Day and I'd take it down, eh, maybe March. <laughs> but anyway, it was a really, really special time, you know, to, um, to you know, these, these were also, the last picture there was third and fourth graders. And they would literally have a field day and they would come over to, uh, first of all, they would have all their pictures. Some of them would do, you see in the background, there's either photos or either they do an essay. And I would do this whole art gallery in the vestibule of the village hall. And then they would do a field day, they would come over, their parents would come over, they would go down to 
the boardroom and I would introduce the mayor. That was their highlight to get, you know, they get to meet the mayor. And then they actually would sit, sit on a dais and do like a program. And we did this for about 10 or 11 years. And near the end, they literally would do the whole program themselves. And Letitia Ellis was one of the teachers who's now a teacher now in DC. And um, it was really a special, special time. It was one of the highlights of my job, to be very honest with you. But uh, yeah, those are those pictures. I, my favorite memory, Brenda, of you was about 10 years ago, I went into the Village Hall and just happened to walk into the trustee boardroom and you were leading a class in uh, Black history with, what were, must have been fourth graders. Yes, yes. Uh, it yes. was, you were, you were very powerful and they were spellbound and uh, you know how to hold a, Hold an audience. Uh, <laughs> well, this was I, I what I said. The people are, are have questions and making comments. We'll we'll wait till the end, Brenda. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll try to speed it up. All right. That was actually in um, in D.C. and I was chosen by the preservation organization of New York State. Uh, to go into lobby in the Congress. So it was really a wonderful, wonderful experience. I had to be trained and all of that, but we actually, I actually was in the hall of the Congress, you know, actually lobbying for, to hold, make sure we keep our preservation funds. So that was pretty cool. This is me in front of what was the um, original Southampton African American Museum or the barber shop. And if you want to, I just want to make a quick note of the two doors, which was really key. On the right was the door that would enter the beauty parlor, and on the left was the door that entered the barber shop. And there was a divider in the middle of all of that. And so, you know, growing up, my auntie, you know, she also taught us how to be a lady. And we didn't, we weren't supposed to go on the other side, you know, because the guys were you know, usually saying sometimes bad language or whatever. That's what, you know, we were told at the time. Um, but I always got a little treat sometime when my auntie had to give Mr. Emmanuel Seymour, who was the actual owner in the building, the barber of that, um, that building in the 40s. Um, I'd have to go and give him, you know, maybe the rent or give him a message or whatever. So I got to peek in to see what the barbershop was like. But um, those were some good times. And on the far side, right behind me, was originally the juke joint and restaurant um, that was run by um, Arthur Robinson, AKA Fives. And um, so it was, you know, that was where the, you know, it was a gathering place for the African Americans, the Blacks during that time, you know. And also, this will tie in with I had done an interview talking about there was another juke joint there at Bolden Square. And um, Sheila, who's online with us now, she confirmed that um, it was definitely a juke joint there called the Colvin. And so maybe um, Sheila can expound on that too. You know, she gave us um, some really good background on that. So maybe, Sheila, you can tell the audience more about the Colvin. Well, the only thing I know is that my dad, who was a really good piano player who worked for the telephone company, went there a couple of times to play the piano. And he said he and Mrs. Cavanaugh, he, that was Herb McCarthy's mother, she was the proprietress. And he said Mrs. Cavanaugh and he were the only white faces in the joint. But everybody loved his piano playing. And he came home one night, I think he'd only played piano there maybe, two or three Friday or Saturday nights. He used to go late, like 10. And he came home one morning at five and he was a little <laughs> bit flushed because people kept buying him beards because he, they loved the way he played the piano. And my mother got up and started yelling at him and he emptied his pockets on the table and he had dollars and dollars and fives and fives and four. Uh, great tips. He had more money in his pocket that they had given him <laughs> as tips than wow. in a week at the telephone company. <laughs> but my mother said, you're starting to like it too much. You can't go there again. Oh, wow. So she stopped him from going. Wow. Stopped him from going because he was having too good a time, I guess. <laughs> But you know, those pictures are, are awesome, but also Shirley, you got me on a mission now because you tell me, you know, you let me know or Tom found those pictures that was donated. Tom, you said those pictures was donated and they were, came out of the basement or they came from the juke joint there at Boulder Square? Oh, she, Sheila and I found them in uh, the McCarthy house on South Main Street. Wow. They were in a closet and uh, we were both like, 
we don't we didn't know anything about them. We were trying to save Southampton his, history. We didn't know that they were Southampton history. We didn't care. We just wanted to keep them. Yeah, we liked. Them. Yeah, it was Lori McCarthy who was married to her Lori, McCarthy, right. and before that, she was married to she was Lori Tucker of Tucker Mill Inn. Tucker Mill is part of oh, South Hampton College. Yes, right. But you got me on a mission now, Sheila, because you said that your dad um, took piano lessons from a woman, a black woman in Sag Harbor. I, I talked to my brother and sister and, you know, it, it's a long time ago and there's nobody around that we can actually, you know, confirm this with, except our own little memories. But my dad was the eldest of 11 and there wasn't an awful lot of money. But my grandmother played the piano and had a piano. And daddy wanted to learn how to play the piano. So she hired a woman, a black woman, who was apparently the piano player in a cat house, a, a bordello, a brothel. That was in uh, Sag Harbor. And I'm not sure where it was, but there was rumored to be a house of ill repute a couple of doors or maybe next door to what that bar that used to be known as Pete's mm -hmm. on the um, Sag Harbor Turnpike. It's, it's a couple of uh, doors down from the railroad tracks on the east side on the right. I think it's still there. I'm not sure what it is now. But um, that may have been where she played the piano. Well, I Googled, you know, the other day, because, you know, you got me on a mission. I Googled real quick on um, brothels in Sag Harbor or whatever, and it came up. Dan's paper, I'm going to follow up with Dan's paper, had, had um, the title Secret Places in the Hamptons that you didn't know, something like that. And in, the, in that, they talked about um, the brothels in, in Sag Harbor. So I'm going to try to follow up if I can. Oh, I, good. That, no. That's yeah. yeah. It's fun. It's fun to think about stuff that we took for granted way back when, and now Absolutely. it's history. She, Sheila noted that, uh, you know, those are real faces in that painting. They're not just characters or whatever. Those are real people. So, And, I, and I'm going to tell you something. Seriously, and that's why I was going to, I'm looking at that picture, the gentleman with the hat. I'm, I can almost put my money down that is Elton Etheridge. And he just, unfortunately, he just passed away. But I can almost, I mean, that looks just like him. It looks just like him. The hat, the how outfit and everything. I could be wrong, but that's who it looks like to me. The paintings are dated 1946. Wow. Wow. So that guy, I don't know, maybe a 20. Yeah, I, his... I, think, I think it had to be Elton's father or uncle or something. Say it again? Well, maybe not. No, because Elton was not that old be hanging in a bar. Oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But I swear it looks it looks like it looks a lot like him. Right. So I bet I bet that some of the older people and maybe some of the younger people with photographs could identify. We should have a contest. Yeah, we should. We should. We should. We should. Well he's very interested in that woman in the yellow dress. <laughs> You would see that, Tom. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're gonna. Well, anyway, these these are these those paintings will be seen someday in the uh, at the Sam. So. Yes, and I, and I want to thank the Southampton Historical Museum for donating that to the Southampton African American Museum for sure. It was hard to give up, Brenda. I, I really. <laughs> for selfish reasons. For selfish. Of reasons. course, of course, of course, of I course. Love, I just love those paintings. Okay, next. So, you know, we can move on really quickly. This is just, you know, um, the Southampton African American Museum um, ran for 10 years. We had spoken word and live jazz, and we had um, film festivals during that time. So that's actually uh, the 10th annual, I think was my last one, really, uh, we had. And that's the gentleman from um, CTV that works in uh, Southampton. And we can move on. That's actually uh, one of the last events we did with uh, uh, Katrina Brown. It was called Traces of the Trade. Her family, um, she found that her family was a, um, the highest uh, tr uh, slave trade family um, in the United States of America. So she did a, she actually did a documentary about it. And so we screened it there at the Southampton Arts Center a few years ago. 
And this is a uh, mahogany do that was at um, the Southampton um, Historical Museum. And maybe Tom can talk a little bit more about that. It was really wonderful. Um, this is one of my first, so one of my first big art uh, exhibits that I curated. And it was really, really successful. I think Tom said you were, it was one of the highest uh, attended. I'll let you. Brenda, the, you and I cooked this up and we did uh, uh, two, two exhibits that were a uh, year apart. Mm -hmm. I never had so much fun. And just bringing, bringing these uh, African-American artists that live on the South Fork mm -hmm. that nobody knows about. They had national reputations, but nobody locally knew how, how, how good the work was or how famous they were outside of their own neighborhood, which maybe is not surprising for a lot of people. But uh, we had uh, one, one, of the, one of the two openings, we had 350 people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was spread out over two hours. It went on to like three and four. But um, when, one, uh, uh, one man came up to me and, and thanked me and said, you know what, I never thought I would be allowed to be inside the Rogers Mansion. Wow, I never knew that. And I, I can't further give that. And I'm getting chills just thinking about because that's what I wanted to do when I got here. Wow. Well, I remember when you first came, when you first hired at the South End Historical Museum. You came over to my office when I was working as assistant oh, no. to the mayor. I'm going to say it. And um, you came into the office. You said, uh, what's all the diversity? There's no diversity here. What's up? And I remember you saying that. And that was really how Mahogany Do, you know, came about because of that. I, I know I made a lot of people unhappy doing that. And, you know, I didn't care. I know you didn't. And I, and I appreciate that. And these are all continued pictures. Um, you see... Um, Herb Randall, he was one of the artists. It was Frank Wimbley, Wimble there was an artist there. Uh, Joanne Carter, Michael Butler. It was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, occasion. It really, really was wonderful and well attended. And that's me and my one of my BB, BFFs from Harlem. I originally used to hang out with her when you know people used to come to, to Southampton for the summer. I used to go to Harlem, 125th Street, um, and hang out with, um, that's T Canada. And I don't know who the other woman is, but those are, these are all pictures from from that event. It was really, really well 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 attended. And that's um, we're going to move on to St. Martin. Um, I go to St. Martin. I've uh, been going to St. Martin since 2010, um, and then I start going for the whole winter as I start rejourneying in 2015. And you're not playing the drums, right? No, I'm not playing the drums. I'm not. <laughs> Actually, um, everybody remembers Hurricane Irma um, was a horrible, horrible, horrible um, hurricane. And um, my heart just went out. I mean, I, I, I have like friends, family there now, you know. So I decided I wanted to, to help them. You know, I got online. It was a lot of friends there that I hadn't heard from. I was trying to connect with them. I finally got a connection with uh, someone at a hotel there, the DV Hotel. And he was kind of doing a live, uh, live uh, uh, recording. And he was saying they needed, they desperately needed some um, medical supplies. So I reached out to... Um, uh, a Chandler, Mr. Chandler at the hospital and also at the um, local Bob, um, can't think of his name now, Bob at the pharmacy and the local pharmacy there, uh, Tom. Oh, Chris, Chris, anyway. Grisnick. Yes, Bob Grisnick. So they, I mean, openly gave, um, gave, um, gave supplies. And then another friend of mine who goes to St. Mark, she kept telling me, she said, you need to make this public so people can help you. I said, no, 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 no. This is a personal thing. I don't want to, and she pushed and pushed and pushed. So it was, that's the picture came, uh, the South End Press came to my house and that was a picture. And then after that, my whole living room and one of my back rooms were filled with things, but it was such a wonderful thing. I sent the barrels, um, it was about three barrels we sent, uh, I sent uh, to St. Martin. So it was really a, you know, a, love, uh, a labor of love. And that's um, a picture of, I actually lived um, walking distance to that, to that beach. I lived right there in Grand Cas for several years before, the, uh, before Hurricane Irma. And then I had to, um, I ended up moving and going to another place. And that was me um, 
Um, there's a, radio, a local radio station there where I stay. The gentleman who owns the place I stayed, he's a producer there at uh, the radio station. And I think people who do know me, one thing led to another. And I said, anybody ever inter interview you, Gus? He said, no. So I end up being on the, um, the radio show, which I've been back on several times in St. Martin. So St. Martin is kind of like my second home. People who know, know. And this is Miss Ruby. She's uh, one of the famous artists there. Her name is Ruby Brute. You can actually look her up, B-U-T-E. She's a famous artist on the island. She actually was the first person I met in 2010. And uh, she's an awesome art artist and she's uh, my, a dear friend of mine. And in the middle there is a picture of um, bark cloth is a painting I did when I went to Uganda, which the pictures will come up later. I had a trip to Uganda with my daughter and my granddaughter last October, and that's literally on bark cloth. And that's bark cloth actually from a tree. It's a long story, and we don't have a lot of time for that, but that's Miss Ruby from St. Martin. And these are some of my paintings I did, because what we do is there's a group of paintings, a group of artists that meet at her house, and we call it Ruby Wednesdays. And we would bring um, lunch and probably bottle wine, and we'd have lunch, and then we'd paint for four or five hours. So that was uh, some of my paintings that I did um, while I, since I've been there. And that one on the far top is literally actually a uh, painting of actually where I used to stay um, in St. Martin in Grand Cas. And these are some more pictures of me and my, my friends there on the left. And um, the picture in the middle where it says park here, believe it or not, I used to park cars. <laughs> I parked cars in St. Martin. It's, it's, it's quick story is actually where that is, is where I used to stay. And one time when I was living there, a gentleman and the owner, they used to park cars there. Because when you see those pictures of these beautiful women, on Tuesday nights, they would have a um, what they call a, a, a parade. Um, uh, Mardi Gras, that's what they called it. And so they would park cars. A lot of other people would park cars for $5. So after um, one time I was sitting there and they needed help. They said, Brenda, would you help us, you know, get some cars in there? So I said, okay. So I would go out and, you know, get the cars coming in. So after a couple of years now, I've gone back. The building is no longer there. Unfortunately, it's got destroyed. But the owner that lives next door that owns the property now, they asked me if, you know, if you want to park cars there, you can park cars if you want to. So for fun, I do it. And I make maybe $100 a night. So it's kind of fun. I meet a lot of wonderful people. I'm learning how to speak French. So, and those are my reggae guys. You know, I love reggae. And those are some of the band guys that some of the um, reggae places I was going to. Um, I had a place, a reggae place to probably listen to music almost every night. And that's another picture of, I think this is a picture, I'm not sure if this is, is this Uganda? Yeah, this is, you. this is actually Uganda. I did a lot of traveling. Um, I went to, um, my first trip was um, in 89. And that was actually, I have, I found the tag actually, African 89, and that was on a mission trip. And that was, um, actually a trip at the Zulu village. And the first thing we did was actually go on also a safari. And then we went on a mission trip where we actually, you know, began to do missions, you know, spreading the word of God. I'll just say uh, that's basically what we did. But that was actually in Africa. And that was um, parts where I, I traveled to was um, Maputo, Mozambique, Tanzania. And so we ended up driving and getting on a cruise ship and we cruised up the East coast of Africa. And, uh, that was in 89. And also I went to Hawaii, the picture on the top with me on the ground there waving and oh boy, <clears throat> I'm getting exposed to myself. You see all those handsome guys on that float? Well, that was a, a parade we went to in a Hawaii and I just automatically just ran up to the, <laughs> to the float. And good thing my sister didn't take the picture but they were literally trying to pull me up on the, on the float. But anyway, that was in um, Hawaii with my sister. And then the other picture there is the cruise I went on with my sister. I went snorkeling. Um, um, that was in Cancun. It was an East, I think, East Coast uh, Caribbean cruise that we went on. So that was pretty cool. We had a fun there doing, uh, doing that cruise. And the next picture, that's the picture of me and my, it was a three generational trip to Uganda. Um, it was a wonderful one of you. And actually my granddaughter, um, 
who graduated from FIT, she's the one who um, really organized this whole trip to Uganda. We were there for two weeks. And she purposely went because she's going to be designing clothes with um, the bark cloth that you saw me with that picture. So that was the main reason why we want to do, she wanted to do that trip. But it was an absolutely fantastic, amazing, memorable trip that I will never, we will never, will never forget. That's um, at the actual um, place where they had the bark cloth. We actually went into the woods with the people and they showed the whole demonstration. With a lack of time, I could have showed more pictures. One day I'll show a whole big slide that I've, I'll do. But um, this gentleman um, was the gentleman, older gentleman, who actually taught the people that worked their English. And he was just, you know, a nice little dear guy. But I'll tell you a little funny story. I think people know me. I was just a friendly, you know, friendly person. I sat with him and I was holding his hand and he left. And he paid any mind. He left, but he came back with this little old phone and he was trying to get my digits, okay? <laughs> So it was kind of comical and I was kind of shocked because I didn't mean, you know, to, to, you know, that wasn't my intention. It was just me being friendly, but it was kind of cute. Everybody was laughing at me and teased me forever about that. <laughs> this was Cornell West. This is a, a more, more of a recent one. Um, it wasn't really a travel. This happened to be, um, he was speaking at the uh, Watermill Center and uh, me and Georgette Greer, we want to go so bad. And just so happened, I'm in CVS here in Southampton. I'm coming out, I think it was getting a card or something. I'm coming, out of, coming down the aisle of CVS to go check out and who I run into but Cornell West. So it was just um, supposed to happen. And um, he said, I said, oh my God, I said, me and Georgia have been trying to get to see, you know, your, your, um, your, your, your talk. And he says, you know, what you can't, you can't come. I said, well, they said it was all filled. He reaches in his pocket. He said, what's your name? You're going to be my guest. So we had front row seats at his, um, had his talk in, what, in um, Watermill Center. It was absolutely wonderful. He acknowledged his new friends, Brenda Simmons and Georgia. So it was kind of cool. Pretty cool. That's um, um, actually on um, uh, Pond Lane. That's in front of uh, Pierce Concert, you know, the former slave Pierce Concert, who we're going to really elaborate on, you know, another time, due, you know, due to time. I'm just going to say that uh, Pierce Concert was a former slave here in Southampton, and we advocated for his house. And make a long story short, we were able to have a ceremony. We erected that um, historical um, sign and also his, the street. Pond Lane is also named Concert's Way. So we, you know, stay tuned. We're actually, you know, in the process of um, making that happen. Uh, you, re you worked really hard on that. And it took, I don't know, eight years. It was a, it was a long time coming. And, and you, you put your heart and soul into that, Brenda. You really yeah, it was, um, I, I had a lot of sleepless nights over that. I, I won't get into details, but I had a lot of sleepless nights how that all went down. If anybody's interested, you can look up Pierce Concert, P-Y-R-R-H-U-S, C-O-N-C-E-R, and you will find, you know, some really good, interesting, he was an extraordinary man who ended up, you know, having a well, you know, he ended up having, um, being known uh, uh, all over the world, basically. That's, a, that's another program. That's a definitely another program for sure. And that's, you know, we're trying to wind it up here. That's me and a gentleman that lives right here in Southampton. And that was um, the day um, I was actually driving down to go to Cooper's Beach. And um, they were doing a celebration um, when um, Biden and Kamala got um, elected. And... And you know, before if before I end up, I know we we'll um finishing time, but if you mind, I want to read um, two poems. I'm also a poet, so I just want to read two poems if you don't mind. Um, the first one is called "I Am Poem." It says, "I am rhythm, I am rhyme, dancing, swaying, hips, stomping feet to the Caribbean beat on time, expressing my inner hurts, pains, and victorious joy." I am poem. Like rhythm and blues, ups and downs, I laugh out loud, and sometimes my smile is upside down to the injustice of this world and the inequality, inequality of engraved laws set not for me and mine. Is it time for revolution? I am poem. I see three, I see through with x-ray eyes, revealing your truth of good and evil, pain and suffering. I see you trying to get free 
from childhood days, questioning why and when you left me. Where do I begin? I am poem. Venturous and private, open and shut to protect my precious jewels of love and delight. And I give it all away, body and soul, with mind altered truth of an experience only I can share when I choose to heal and to help to relate with no more shame. I am poem. Rich in this and that education on, on levels of highs and lows to give a perspective of dissect of what you say I suppose to believe. Without me or my people in mind, I choke on your truth and spit it out because it sickens my virtue of who I really am, a proud black woman discovering the world through tragic moments and unspoken lies of abuse and turmoil only relieved by the outspoken words that take me in and bring me out with my hands on my hip and a wide loving smile, I say to you, I am poem, I am love. Yay, that was great, Brenda, that was so beautiful. Joanna, can you read some of the comments or questions? Um, I so thought I can tell the story about me watching TV too, but we'll do that another time, I guess. Another time. We got we got comments and, and Sheila's uh, getting antsy. She's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I find it so fascinating, Brenda, that so many of your family members returned to the South. That's from Sue. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a real blast from the past. I work at the my father's store at... 120 North Sea Road in the 70s. I mm -hmm. remember the diner and barber shop, and of course, Fanny Herb and his postcards from wow. Karen. Wow. Then we have what can we do to support the African American Museum? You can go to www.saamuseum.org, and there's a part in the bottom there where you can definitely. Um, send your support and we welcome that and I thank you. All right, let me see. We have a question from Jackie. Um, Jackie, uh, if you unmute yourself, you'll be able to um, ask your question. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Brenda, can you hear me? Yes, we can, love. How are you, love? Oh, I'm doing really well, really well. Thank you so much for this lovely presentation. Thanks to Rogers Memorial Library also. And I just wanted to stress one fact, and I think you might agree with me that most of the wives um, in Southampton, there were many families, um, intact families, and most of the wives were domestic workers. Yes. Who really stressed education. Yes. And, and going to school and getting good grades and going to uh, going on to higher education, probably because of the um, not so easy life that they had as domestics. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, Jackie. And, you know, that's one thing that I re you're making me remember, too, that, you know, unfortunately, the guidance councils really weren't the ones who encouraged us. It was our parents and the upperclassmen like you guys that were really encouraging us to go to college, you know? That's, 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 that's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining, Jack. Oh, you're welcome. If there's no other uh, comments or questions, I, I want to thank Brenda Simmons so much. Um, I, I think Sheila Geiderer, uh, the, our, my museum trustee, and I both uh, are so happy that uh, we've had this collaboration with you, Brenda. I th you've made the Southampton History Museum a better place, and uh, all the best. You, you do an amazing job bringing uh, the, the Southampton African American Museum to life. So you're, you've got tons of energy, and you've got another 50 years, Brenda. And yeah, thanks, thanks. And I'm going to keep going to St. Martin for the winter that keeps me regenerated. <laughs> then we also have uh, Elliot Smith who would like to talk. Go ahead. Hi, Elliot. How are you, Brenda? I'm good. I have, you know what's interesting? It's interesting to see how you're, um, how you're developing this into a, into a community. It's just interesting of your, of your dedication to the community. 
Thank you this so is much. Interesting. At you. large, because you used to work in the village hall, and it's just interesting to see your background mm. to understand different things that people don't understand today in this world. It's true. It's just interesting, but it brings back memories to remember. Because you know, it brings back a lot of memories, Brid Bridget, that you have brought to my mind. When I look at some of them pictures, it really brings back a whole lot of memories mm -hmm. of people when they were younger yes. and when they were older. Yes. And, and it's just fascinating to see how different people help different people out. Yes. yes. In different atmospheres going on. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting and fascinating to see how you're improving it to other people in the world. It's just interesting. It's, it's definitely a comeback. Very fascinating. You know, the other thing too, honestly, you know, a, the, a lot mm -hmm. of the black families are gone now. So that's mm -hmm. my main point for the museum is to leave a legacy that we did, we were here mm -hmm. and we are here mm -hmm. and we contribute mm -hmm. a lot to the village of Southampton. So thank you so much, Elliot. 